So a little pop up for everyone to say continue on. Hopefully we do. Uh, before we get going, are there any questions, quick questions for the day? Like uh, how did the videos from uh, last week go? They went good. Um, I just had a question on when we do the examples, do you want us to just like show the script file? Like do the example, you know, because like during each of the videos you have, you know, examples in our script. You want to just kind of just have us type those in for each example? Yeah, I want you to put those into um, our markdown. Mm -hmm. Inside our markdown, I'd like you to put those into code chunks. So if you all have some, you know, let's say you're trying to make some, enter some code in for Monday here. What you'll do is go up here to insert mm -hmm. and you'll insert an R code chunk. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. And then your code will go in here. The only reason I do it inside a script file is because this sort of stuff takes up excess lines and I really need all the space I can get um, when I'm writing out the code because I generally try to fill the whole screen with a bunch of code that we're working through. Oh, so I, I do it in a script file to save space but you all should take that code and put it into a uh, into one or many code chunks inside your course notes. That makes sense because we're working in R Markdown. Um, Correct. Okay. Great question. Thank you, Jared. Was that right? Yes. Nice. Appreciate it. Okay. What else we got? Okay, well then here we go. Today is going to be about density functions. Most, uh, maybe not most, a lot of people call them probability density functions, but the word probability in the world of statistics is just thrown in front of everything that it almost becomes meaningless. So I just call them density functions. And when we are in the world of statistics, it's just kind of known that they're probability density functions. So here we go, density functions. I'm gonna start off with a quick example. I'm actually gonna ask you all if you have uh, any examples that you, you know, stuck out in your mind throughout last week. And if you don't, I'm going to make one up on the spot. I'm then going to try to give us a um, informal definition of uh, density functions. It's going to be super informal. Then we'll move on to some properties. Uh, that's where we'll start getting a little bit more strict in our notation and uh, abstract mathematics. Um, I planned two examples for this lecture, but the first section of this class asked so many good questions that I didn't actually get to my two examples. And instead, we just went through examples that they came up with. So um, if you all ask a bunch of questions about the properties, and that leads us into some different examples than I have planned. That's totally fine and encouraged. I think that'll be more meaningful for you all if you develop the questions yourself. But if we don't, then I have two examples planned. And if we have time at the end of this lecture, I'm gonna introduce some new notation for sums and integrals. It won't be so bad, but it will be new. Um, okay, here we go. Oops. Okay, so density functions allow us to define the pattern for which random data will appear. So that is if we're in the world of statistics and we have this process, 
that is going to generate data for which we don't know any future value. If we're in the world of statistics, there's going to be some process that generates data for which we don't know the value before we actually observe the thing. So if you're like flipping a coin, before you flip the coin, you don't know whether you're gonna get heads or tails. If you're rolling a die, singular for dice, if you're rolling a die, you don't know which of these six sides you're going to get before you roll the die next and observe, oh, I happen to get a three. In the world of statistics, we don't know what values we will get next. But density functions allow us to say that there is some pattern for which the values that are possible will show up. Is that okay? We've already seen some um, examples of this, and I just realized that I was supposed to do a quick definition, a quick example first. So. We're just going out of order, apparently. And you all will deal with it. Quick example. So I'm going to keep to my plan. Was there any examples that meant uh, a lot to you all, was like particularly interesting to you all from last week's labs? Or do you just want me to make up an example here? I'm OK if you make one up. Thanks. Apparently one person gets the whole vote here, y'all. So we're just going to go with an unfair die, because that was what was in my head as I was going. So a die has the sides 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And on the, the y-axis, we're going to put the density function for an unfair die. So we could theoretically have a die that looks like this. The most likely values from our unfair die are smaller numbers. The smaller numbers are more likely to show up when we roll the die next. So like our informal definition was saying, we don't know what value we're going to get next, but we do know by the density function that one, two, and three are the more likely values than four, five, and six. This density function is showing us a pattern for which numbers will show up if we were to repeatedly roll the die. When you say unfair die, are you saying that this is basically a weighted die? So like yeah. one, two, and okay, so it's not even odds, okay. Yeah, no, it's not even odds. It's just really, I'm going to step away, but I'm still talking and I can still hear you all. It's just really saying uh, a weighted die. The weights associated with the different values that can show up on the die are not equal. Some people call it a weighted die in the world of statistics. I call it an unfair because it doesn't have um, equal probabilities for all of the sides of the die. But these are definitely just synonyms for the same idea. Not all of the values show up with equal probability. Are we doing OK so far? Any other questions? Does this seem to fit with what you all saw from the uh, named distributions in the videos last week? Yeah. Good. Okay, I keep trying to give pauses here for you all to say more things, but I keep getting like onesies, twosies talking to me. Onesies, twosies is better than none, but I encourage the rest of you to say something. Okay, so we're gonna move on. Properties. Let f be the density function. A 
associated with distribution, capital F. I don't have a specific distribution in mind, so I'm just giving it a very general name, capital F. It could be any of the ones we've looked at, uh, Bernoulli, binomial, uh, that might've been all the ones we've looked at so far, but we're going to look at more, uniform, gamma, normal, any of these with standard names. In this case, F satisfies two things. F is a function from some sample space to the non-negative real numbers. I'm going to use this R for real numbers with a subscript plus to mean non-negative real numbers. So if we were going to say this in English, we would say density is non-negative. The values returned by a density function can be zero and otherwise must be positive, but they will never be negative. So if you ever have a function that returns a negative value ever, then it is immediately not a density function. All density functions must return non-negative values. OK? Two. I'm going to define this new operator, this new function, but I'm going to keep referring to it as an operation. Uh, I'm going to define this new operator named expectation. And the crazy thing about it is it applies to functions. So I'm going to say it's going to apply to the function that is the indicator function on the domain of the density function. That's the same S right there. And this operation is going to be equal to 1. Since you don't know what this function does, I'm going to say this one out in English, and then we're going to talk about it for a little bit. This expectation operator is like a generalized integral. So essentially what we're saying is the area under the density function is equal to one. But this expectation is generalized because if the domain of the density function, if the sample space here is countable or finite, then this operation is going to be a sum. On the other hand, if the domain of the density function, if the sample space is uncountably infinite, then we can't take sums. Sums will explode. They will diverge. And instead, this expectation operator turns into an integral. So Could I'm going to have an, e an example of uh, one of each, perhaps. Yeah. Definitely. So, um, John, I believe that was, it sounds like you are already kind of maybe getting the idea, but what you're asking for is this section. <laughs> so indeed, I will have two examples for us after I say just a little bit more about this function. Gotcha. Is that fair? You can wait. Yep, totally fair. Five. Thanks so much. This operation is going to be different than most functions you've seen before. The reason is this, whether it's a sum or an integral, is a function that takes a function. Remember, this indicator function is really just a 1 if the argument is within the set S, and a 0 if the argument is not in the set S. So this is actually some like new crazy tool 
that you've probably never really encountered before. It's a function that takes a function, does some operation on it, and returns a number. And not only is it crazy because it takes a function and then returns a number, it does sums or integrals with respect to density functions. So not only is there like a sum or an integral wrapped up into this single uh, letter, the single operation, there's also like two implicit functions wrapped up in it. There's one function, which is the argument, and another function, which is the density function of interest. OK, so how about just a little quick picture before we dive into my main two examples. This is just me trying to copy down the example we had before of an unfair or weighted die. And I'm just trying to recreate it close enough. So look, if the function is the indicator function on the set S, and S here is just the set of integers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, then all we're saying is the area under all these points must sum to 1. This is essentially all we're doing. All the orange heights must add up to one for our unfair die example. So they're basically like percentages and they all have to add up to 100%, which would be one? Correct. Jacob, your intuition there is spot on. The only thing that's going to change in your understanding of what you just said for the rest of the semester is we're going to change um, percentages to probabilities. And that, uh, and I don't care about the 100%. The 100% or one, whether you use decimals or um, percentages is not an issue. But otherwise, for discrete ones like this, these will be probabilities. For ones like I'm going to show you an example uh, soon, they will not necessarily be probabilities. OK, I've got just one more quick example. Nah, John, you asked your question first, so I'll do your question first, and then I'll, then I'll show you some more details. OK, so let f be the density function associated with the discrete uniform distribution. OK, there's two things new here. The first is this word discrete. Discrete really just means that the sample space is finite and equals the set of integers a, a plus 1, all the way up to b minus 1 and b where A is less than or equal to B. So discrete is like a statistician's word for a distribution over a countable set. In this case, it means F is, S is finite and specifically equal to the set of integers from A to B, where A is less than or equal to B. The density function for this takes on this form. It's not immediately obvious why it takes on this form, but that's part of today's lecture. So we want a uniform distribution to have the same density across all values in the support. 
the only way we're going to ensure the density function has the same values across all the sport is if x does not play a role. So this is just constant. In a picture, we'd start at a, we'd have however many values we needed to up to b, and we'd have the same value across all values in the support. And that's what uniform that? means. You said, uh, what is only true for when x is constant? It's being uniform? Yeah, the uniform distribution is saying that every value in the sample space, a through b, all the integers a through b, have the same density. They're all supposed to be on a horizontal line here, and I did my best to draw that. And you can see that in the density function itself because x does not show up in the density function. This is a constant. So are there b minus a plus one distinct points? Alex, perfect. The only way we can satisfy that all of the area under this function sums to one is by ensuring that we give density to each element one over the number of elements in the set, A to B. The only way we can ensure property number two that says all the area under the function within the sample space is equal to one is by giving density one over the number of elements in the sample space. And so what Alex figured out was that indeed there are B minus A plus one elements in this sample space. Think of it for a, for a die where A is one and B is six. B is six, so we go six minus one, five plus one. And indeed, there are six faces to a fair die. If you wanted to write that out as a sum, you'd essentially just go one over B minus A plus one. And how many of these terms would you have in this sum? The amount of elements? Indeed. You'd have exactly the amount of elements. Number of terms that look like this. And so you all tell me, what is this thing equal to? One. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Aislinn. <laughs> one, indeed. So if you have B minus A plus one terms of one over B minus A plus one, you are indeed ensuring that the sum across all the elements in the sample space is equal to one. Okay, what's the other property we should check? Non-negative. Perfect, was that Brendan? Thanks, Brendan. Okay, so what if A equals one and B equals six? Is F of X non-negative? In that case, F of X is equal to? Six. 
not six. Or one over six, sorry. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so in this case, A and B were both positive. And so it doesn't take, you know, too much thought to see that if A and B are both positive and A is less than or equal to B, this is always gonna be positive. But what if one of them's negative? But not the other one. It's so one over eleven. One over eleven. Jacob, you want to tell us how you got that? I just checked B minus A and B is five, A is negative five, so five take away negative five is 10, and then 10 plus one is 11 for the denominator. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, so in this case, we still get non-negativity. Is there like one last example we should kind of convince ourselves of? Two negatives. Two negatives, you wanna pick them? Negative three, negative six. Which one's which? Uh, A, negative three. And then actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just thinking that. Mm -hmm. So A's got to be? A has to be, yeah, A has to be bigger. Okay, so Smaller. negative three. Negative three. A has smaller. to be smaller. Sorry, I'm trying to think here. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Take your time. Negative six. seven, negative six. Like this? Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, perfect. Thank you. In this case, what do we get for the density? Doesn't have to be the same person. We know a one's gonna be in the numerator because that just always happens. One half. One half. Indeed. If there's only these two elements in here, how many integers are between negative seven and negative six inclusive? Only two, right? So if we're going to split up the density uniformly, that means equal amongst all the elements, then we got to put one half density on each element. And that's exactly what this formula is telling us based on the logic that Alex suggested early on. B minus A plus one is just counting the elements in this set. So when it's a negative five to five, do you include zero? That's why it's one over 11. So actually what's going on is notice when you start counting from this element in the set, starting mm -hmm. from A, you're all like one, two, three, four, five, six. So really what you're doing is just counting for that extra element down there, hiding away at the bottom. So from negative seven to negative six, there's two elements. Negative from... seven and negative six. Negative five to five, there's 11 elements. I mean, isn't that the way you just did the math? Negative five, negative four, negative three, negative two, negative one, one, two, three, four, five. That's 10 elements. Plus one. Oh, is it always plus one? It's always plus one right here. But negative seven to negative six wasn't plus one. Was it not? Would example one be one over seven then? Or am I miscounting? Six minus one is five plus one is six. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. Okay. Negative five minus five is negative zero. 10. Oh, oh, yeah. Plus one. Mm 
Yeah, I mean, I, I get how we did that. I just thought you said because the last example, negative seven, negative six, you have two elements. That's why it's one over two. And then oh, I was wait, like, I messed this one up. Is it 10 elements? I don't know. Hang on, Jacob. I just realized I messed this one up. This one is five minus a negative five. Yes. Yeah. One. I just wanted to get my notes right in it. That one stumped me for half a second. Negative six minus a negative seven plus one. So the negative six plus seven is one, plus one is two. We all okay here? Yeah. Can each of these uh, like cases, we covered po two positive, a positive and a negative, and a negative, and then two negatives. Each of those like sets can be placed into the bracket, like A comma A plus one to B minus one and B. Mm -hmm. And so one will have six elements, two will have 11, and three will have two. Correct. This denominator here is essentially just the formulaic way to count the number of elements in this set. Okay, so we just checked that the discrete uniform distribution here represented mathematically, here represented as a picture for general values A and B, that is we don't care how many elements there are in the set so long as it is a finite number of elements. We didn't prove it, but we certainly went through and said, okay, it seems reasonable to assume that um, F is always non-negative no matter what values of A and B you pick. And then the second property is that the sum of all the values within the sample space is equal to one. So the area under the function is equal to one. And that wasn't so bad because you're essentially just looking at this formula added up this many times. For each element in the sample space, you have this density function. This is just f at a, and then you'd have f at a plus one, then f at a plus two, plus all the way up to f of b minus one and f of b. Since this formula is just counting up the number of elements in there, we have this many elements times the density function. And indeed, we get out one as area under the function. John, how is this for a first example on a countable set where that expectation operator turns into a sum? Perfect, thank you. Great. Other follow-up questions before we take a similar example, but do it as an integral instead of a sum. So <clears throat> we use this if they're all the same uh, densities underneath the dots? Yeah, if you want to assign uniform, that is the same density to every element in the set. If you believe that it's reasonable to assume all elements in the set will have equal probability, then this is the distribution you take. So this works for a fair coin, a fair die, this works for randomly selecting any one card out of a deck, as long as you don't care what face or suit it has. And it turns out this is going to be the basis for many of our calculations in the world of probability. 
in life, do we use these more or the other type that we're about to learn about? The other type that we're about to learn about. Because usually things aren't fair. Because usually things aren't fair, indeed. Our first example with the unfair diet, that would still be discreet, right? Correct. Nice. Okay. Way to go, John. It just wouldn't be uniform, right? Perfect. Way to go, Alex. In fact, for the unfair die example I gave you, there is no like name for that distribution. It's just like an unfair six outcome distribution. There's no name for it. It's just a, a distribution that satisfies these two properties. The density function is always non-negative and the area under the function, the density function must sum to one. Great, y'all, I really appreciate the questions. I'm gonna move on, but don't let that discourage you. You'd mentioned that was accountable. So is the other portion then uncountable? Ah, perfect, that's where we're headed. Let okay. F be the density function. associated with the continuous uniform distribution. And continuous is stats fancy word to say that S is an uncountable interval A to B with A strictly less than B. So I think you all attach to the picture better than you did the function. That was just my read, but you know what? I'm not the best at reading faces over Zoom yet, so I'm working on it. So, but I'm trying, so I'm gonna draw you a picture this time. So instead of having uh, a bunch of tick marks along the x-axis, I'm not gonna draw the tick marks because this is an uncountable set. And that's my best attempt at drawing a smooth horizontal line across the values A to B. To say that uniform, just like Alex read, is going to mean all the values have the same density. And just like Josiah was picking up, now we have an uncountable number of elements in the interval from A to B with A strictly less than B. Do you all wanna take a guess at what this is? If you need all the area under this function to equal one, you don't even really need to do the integral yourself. This is just a box. How do you find a box, the area of a box? The integral. Well, okay, if you don't want to do the integral, how do you find the area of a rectangle? You could do- Length width times side. width. Fantastic, so what's the length? A to B. A to B, and so what's the height have to be if that needs to be? In this a case, the one. uniform odd. Oh, A to one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And over A to B. And which one's bigger? A to B. OK, yeah. How do we write out A to B to ensure that this thing is positive? B minus A. B minus A. We can't write out A to B, suggesting that A is bigger, because A is smaller. The only way we're going to maintain non-negativity is by starting at B and subtracting off A to get this distance. So in fact, you all just said that the area under this function within the sample space, that is within the interval A to B, is equal to one because we essentially just have length times height.
Now, if you want to go about doing the calculus and integrating that, that's really not terribly difficult. Hopefully that gave us enough to get started and you can fill in the, oh, whoops, I'm, I left out a bit. Okay, I'll let you fill in the blank now that I corrected my typo. And the other piece we checked was that by ensuring B goes first and subtracting off A, since B is always bigger by definition, then we ensure that F of X is greater than or equal to zero for all A and B. Okay, these examples were not the easiest, but I think you all did really well because you learned two new distributions, both uniform, but one discrete and one continuous. Meanwhile, rehearsing what it takes for a density function to be a density function. Any follow-up questions? Yeah, so I guess, um what would be a real life example of a continuous uniform distribution? Oh, that's what this week's uh, lecture videos are about on Wednesday. Okay. So I've got posted um, up on YouTube. Let's see, I think I have two of the most common examples of continuous distributions up on YouTube already. I haven't sent out an official email about it yet because I don't have uh, this lecture recorded and posted. And I like to do that before I send out the official email so that all sections are treated the same. But John, that is an excellent question. There are two examples. One is the gamma distribution up on YouTube already on my channel in a playlist. And the second is the normal distribution, which is the most common distribution statisticians use to date. Gotcha, Even thanks. though even, yeah, totally. Even though the normal distribution fits the least amount of real world examples, it is this weird irony that the normal distribution is the most commonly used, but it fits the least amount of real examples. <laughs> Statistics, you're the worst. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, any other follow up questions before I try to hit our last uh, talking point for the day? For the picture that we're referring to and you know this uh, little example the uniform aspect like mm -hmm. are we saying that all all the odds are one or just the area under the curve is one so it's okay. essentially like i'm, I'm kind of trying to figure out how to uh, think about that the area under the curve is one so for any instance that we're we try to single out for the, any A and B you pick. So in this case, like the value of F of F of X, so the Y axis, mm -hmm. it's all the same chance. But does it matter? Like, is it like, what's the value of Y of that line? We call it density. Okay. Yeah, and that's the unfortunate part. Until we get a little bit further into the class, I don't think density is going to have super solid meaning to us. Density is analogous to probability, but it's not probability because it can be bigger than one. Because so, it's it's like the likelihood of something happening over the total or something like that? Something like that. It's, um, so for the example we had earlier for our unfair die, density is essentially just telling us these values are more likely and these values are less likely. 
But when it's a smooth, continuous distribution like this, we can't exactly interpret it as probability. Because technically- You can only talk about probability of ranges of values, if I exactly. remember right. You can only talk about probability of sets, of ranges of values. You can't talk about probability at any one point. The short answer here is probability is analogous to area under the function. Probability is analogous to area under the function. And for a smooth function like this, how much area is under the point at A? Well, uh, it's like not technically nothing. Perfect. That's why you can't interpret density as probability. You can only talk about probability on sets. So we talk about density for the group, not individual uh, instances. Talk about density for the group, not individual instances. Because you can't like, if, if two, if you made that picture on the screen currently, if you like this one? isolated two, but it was a, a continuous curve. Yeah. Then you couldn't actually like because that's just an uh, a point. Yeah, which is essentially an area of of nothing because it's a constant. Correct. So we wouldn't call that probability. We'd associate just density with. Correct. This point here on the y-axis, f at uh -huh. a is just yes. the density at the point A, but we can't okay. call it probability because probability is area under the function. And at the point A, there is no area under that function. Perfect, thanks. Yeah. Okay, that all is coming in a future lecture anyway. I appreciate the questions because it helps us get a preview of what's to come, but I'm not leaving it on the slide because it technically is a topic of future discussion. So the last bit we're going to have to run through, but we can clean up whatever we don't get to uh, next lecture. So for sums, we have an old notation that looks like this. We're probably used to notation like this, which says to add up all of the n x's. New notation that I'm going to introduce is going to look like this. I want I to be in a set A. Now, this is equal to the old notation, I equal 1 to n of xi, if A consists of the set 1, 2, up to n. OK, so here's the new notation. And I'm showing you that it's equal to the old notation in a specific case, which is telling us that the new notation is more general. But my question is, what if A is equal to 1 to n union k, I don't know what number k is, union um, p, to Q. It would be really nasty to write out a sum across all of these integers. But in fact, if you just did X in A of F of X, that's really quite simple. So we are going to look at sums that are broken up across the union of multiple sets. And it would be nasty to do if you tried to break it out in notation like this. But for notation like this, it's really quite simple. We're just going to say whatever the index is, is the thing that gets replaced, so long as the elements are within the set of interest. I don't have time, since we're already at 350, to show you the new notation for integrals. 
I will introduce that to us uh, next lecture, if you all help me remember. Or if you need to see it this week, you can go check out section one. Section one, we just barely got to it. I think I kept them one minute after class, which I'm trying not to do to you all right now. I'll stick around for about five more minutes, but I got another meeting at four o'clock. So if you all have extra questions, I'm happy to answer them for a little bit, but I can't answer them for too long. I'm gonna stop recording now.